Welcome to our program and part two of a presentation featuring Father Christopher Maha on End of Life Decisions. I'm Carol Owens and there's so much that Father Maha has to share with you today, so I will not be back at the end of the show. Please feel free to contact me, however, at 421-7833, extension 218, for more information on this topic and to obtain your end-of-life booklet. Let's turn our attention to Father Maha on this compelling topic. God's blessings, and please tune in to our future programs. So welcome, or welcome back, if you tuned in to our previous presentation on advanced care planning and end-of-life decisions. And so in our last time that we had our program, we looked at some of the very basic principles that help to guide us in the choices that we make for the end of life for ourselves and for those whom we love. These are important and often many difficult uh, decisions that we are forced to make. And so we wanna take lots of care and lots of attention and lots of prayer to make them properly ahead of time. And so first of all, the basic principle that we looked at was the duty to preserve life uh, but to do so in due measure. In other words, we're not obligated to use all of the means all of the time in every circumstance, but we do what we can do according to reason and according to the principle of ordinary means, uh, which are obligatory, and extraordinary means, uh, which are optional and can be foregone. So we talked last time, how do you choose between ordinary means and extraordinary means? How do I know when something is obligatory and should be used and how do I know when something is no longer necessary? And so we base it upon the weighing up of benefits and burdens. So is something providing a benefit for my health? Is something providing a good to my body that allows me to preserve life in due measure? I mean, if those benefits outweigh the burdens and there's no excessive expense that's attached with it, then I'm obligated to use it to care for my body and to care for my life. Um, if the burdens outweigh the benefits on the other side, then we're not obligated to do that. Um, some examples that we talked about last time were CPR or resuscitation, which is a standard medical practice. So in a hospital or in a nursing home or perhaps if an EMT is helping somebody, it's a standard medical practice for them to resuscitate somebody whose heart has stopped or who has stopped breathing. Um, on the other side of it, of course, if somebody's advanced in years, if they have a terminal illness, uh, and they're perhaps even imminently dying, it might be absolutely appropriate to institute and to request a DNR order or do not resuscitate. So again, these are two different examples that are based not upon a whim, not upon a personal choice, um, but upon reason and upon benefits and burdens and the actual circumstances that the person is going through. A second example is mechanical ventilation. Um, so somebody who would need a respirator to breathe, somebody who has a temporary illness, somebody who's experienced an injury or an accident that is causing difficulty in breathing, uh, when they can experience mechanical ventilation or respirator, might help them to get through that setback and to move forward, then it would be an ordinary means, even though it's a mechanical device. Somebody, of course, who's at the end of life, somebody who's struggling, perhaps even with a terminal illness, who's imminently dying, it would be an extraordinary measure and they could decide not to have it. Um, they could even decide to choose ahead of time and to request a DNI order, so do not intubate. Finally, another example is nutrition and hydration. We talked about that in a particular way last time, um, and the principle of ordinary and extraordinary means still applies. We still weigh up the benefits and the burdens, uh, but for somebody who's imminently dying, the body's inability to assimilate the food and the fluids would render artificial feeding um, extraordinarily burdensome, and so the person could choose to forego that. Um, but again, St. John Paul II and the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in 2009 were very, very clear in reiterating John Paul II's statement from 2004 that in principle, nutrition and hydration should be considered to be an ordinary means of caring for somebody until it's worn out its proper finality, which is the nutrition and hydration of the patient and alleviation of his or her suffering. 
So with that said, I'd like to take a look for a moment at some caveats and some common misconceptions that people have when it comes to making decisions for their advanced care planning and end of life decisions. One of them you might hear sometimes from time to time, that the Catholic Church says I should have everything all the time and I simply don't want that. Let's take a moment to think about that for a minute. That is not what the church teaches. So for somebody to rightly kind of go up against that makes perfect sense, but it's important to remember that the church has never taught that we should have everything all the time in all circumstances. We are called to preserve our lives in due measure based upon the benefits or the burdens of the health care that we're receiving. Uh, a second caveat, moving on, is similar. It says that the Catholic Church tells me I should have everything all the time, which again is not true. And since I am therefore a good Catholic, I simply want to do that. So I'll have all the treatments possibly available to me until the moment that I die. Um, kind of exaggerating it a bit, but many times people make decisions based upon those kinds of thoughts. So to be very careful to avoid that, those two extremes. Uh, one more caveat or misconception that can sometimes happen and often does happen is that people say, those who know me and know what I want will decide correctly for me and everything will work out fine. So people should know what I want and everything will be okay. It's a major misconception which can at times have tragic consequences. So think of some of the many high profile cases that have happened in the United States alone. Uh, back in 2005, the terrible case of Terry Schiavo, a woman who was diagnosed as being in the so-called vegetative state. Um, we had her husband on one hand saying that he knew what she wanted. We had her mother and father and her brother arguing on the other side of it, saying that she did not want to have the feeding tube removed. And so the husband was battling in court for its removal. And we know how high profile that was. We know how difficult it was. And in the end, they removed the feeding tube from Terry Schiavo. And she died, as I mentioned in the previous program, um, not of organ failure. She died not of an infection. She died of a lack of electrolytes and dehydration. It's a terrible way to die, even for somebody who perhaps can't feel that or experience it. Nonetheless, the feeding tube was removed and she died not immediately but within about a week and a half. Now the tragedy, of course, in addition to the fact that she lost her life in that terrible circumstance, was that no one knew what she wanted. They had to argue it out in court. Now back in the 1980s, there was a similar case with a woman named Nancy Cruzan. So Nancy Cruzan, like Terry Schiavo, was also Roman Catholic. And Nancy Cruzan was in a car accident in the state of Missouri in 1983. And she was unconscious, she stopped breathing, she was revived, but nonetheless she was diagnosed later on after severe brain damage of being in the so-called vegetative state. And very similar to Terry Scheiber, there was a battle in the courts between her mother and father and between the hospital itself about whether or not they should remove the feeding tube or re remain on nutrition and hydration. So it could argue it out again, there was a court battle and very similar to the situation with Terry Schiavo, the feeding tube was removed and Nancy Cruzan likewise died uh, about a week and a half after the feeding tube was removed. Um, but again, at the, after that situation, the courts decided that it was time to make something more finite about how we make these decisions so that they could be known ahead of time. And so in the year 1991, we had the Patient Self-Determination Act, which basically requires hospitals and healthcare facilities to inform patients of their right to complete an advanced directive. So to talk to a couple minutes about what an advanced directive is. So an advanced directive is a document that will allow you ahead of time uh, to identify the kind of treatment and the medical care that you would like in the event that you are incapacitated like Terry Schiavo or Nancy Cruzan or unable to communicate your own wishes. And so in the state of Rhode Island, there are two types of advanced directives. First one's called a living will. You've probably heard of that before. And the second one is called a durable power of attorney for health care. So let's take a moment to look at those two different kinds of documents, a living will and a durable power of attorney for health care. So first of all, a living will um, is a document that provides instructions for the withholding or withdrawal of life-sustaining treatments. So it lists sometimes specifically 
in this situation, don't do this. In this circumstance, don't do that. Now, one of the challenges that many of the U.S. bishops have pointed out, and many people that work in end-of-life health care, are that a living will is limited by the examples that are contained within it. So there's only so many medical nightmares that you could dream up and propose and give a solution for, and undoubtedly what can sometimes happen is that something that's not listed in the living will could take place. Um, another limitation of the living will is that somebody else is interpreting the statements that I've given in that document. So somebody's reading it and saying, I think this is what he meant by that. And there's a chance, even a good chance, that that could be misinterpreted and misunderstood. So that's a challenge with the living will. Many of the U.S. bishops have been very clear to say it's not the right course of action to take uh, because of the misunderstanding and the possibility that you would not be well cared for at the end of life. A great alternative is the durable power of attorney for health care. So a durable power of attorney for health care, different from a general durable power of attorney, which allows somebody into my financial information or into information for my property, deals specifically just with their health care. So deals specifically with these decisions for end of life. And what happens with a durable power of attorney for health care is that I appoint an agent. I appoint someone who knows me and understands me, who knows my faith and my wishes for being cared for at the end of my life. And there's a tremendous advantage to doing that. In particular, this is somebody who can choose in real time. In the actual circumstances that I'm going through, this is what he would want. And why is that important? Because medical professionals will tell you from day to day, someone's situation could change. So one day they would need to have a respirator to help them to get through a difficult circumstance, but perhaps their situation would progress and become more critical and it can be removed. Perhaps somebody is benefiting even greatly from nutrition and hydration, but suddenly there's organ failure, maybe multiple organ failure, and they no longer need that nutrition and hydration if they are imminently dying and journeying on that stage from life to death to life eternal. And so it's important to realize that an agent can decide for me moment by moment, somebody who knows me, somebody who loves me, and can make those decisions. <clears throat> In the Diocese of Providence, we've created a Catholic health care directive for Rhode Island, and it's contained in this booklet called End of Life Decisions, A Catholic Perspective. And it's really important to realize that we've created it to outline some of the basic principles and teachings that we've been talking about here today. And so what are those principles? The duty to preserve life, but in due measure. Uh, the use of ordinary means versus extraordinary means and how to tell the difference. Uh, the appropriate use of pain medication, what it means to have palliative care to make me comfortable towards the end of my life, but to use that appropriately and to realize that it's a tremendous benefit for us as we near the end of life. And so in End of Life Decisions, a Catholic perspective which outlines all of those basic principles, we also have contained the directive itself. It's a two-page document that is, in essence, a durable power of attorney for health care. So we we're appointing an agent in that document, somebody who will choose and decide for me. But we've also, moving on, we also have, very beautifully, some of the statements that will guide us in that end-of-life health care. So we're helping somebody to choose for us but we're also outlining very carefully what it is that we want at the end of life. And so what are those specific statements? I'll give you three of them for an example. And the first one deals with what I've mentioned already, what we're discussing, is that there should be a presumption in favor of providing me with nutrition and hydration, including medically assisted nutrition and hydration, unless death is inevitable and truly imminent so that the effort to sustain my life is futile or unless I am unable to assimilate the food and the fluids. Um, that's a really long statement. So <laughs> I'm going to read it again very slowly. So in the healthcare directive we've created, we basically outline the teaching of St. John Paul II and the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops from 2009. And that statement says there should be a presumption in favor of providing me with nutrition and hydration including medically assisted nutrition and hydration, unless death is inevitable 
and truly imminent. So I'm presuming, you know, this is something that's going to be beneficial for me. This is something that's going to be helpful for me. However, again, based upon benefits and burdens, if it's no longer a benefit, then I would like that means removed. So important to realize that it's not everything all the time, nor is it an arbitrary decision that I want something or don't want something. I'm basing it upon how well it's benefiting me or if the burdens have outweighed that benefit. Second example says, in accord with the teachings of the Catholic Church, I have no moral objection to the use of medication or procedures necessary for my comfort. You know, I want to be made comfortable, in particular if I'm agitated, if, if I'm really anxious, if my body's reacting to the illness that is bringing on this end of my life and entrance to eternal life, even if they may indirectly and unintentionally shorten my life. This is beautiful teaching of our Catholic faith, unintentionally, indirectly. In other words, I'm not intending to end my life, but I realize that certain opiates, uh, morphine being among them, not all the time, but sometimes will shorten the dying process. It will actually shorten my life. If that's not my attention, I can certainly use it because it's going to make me comfortable. It's going to help me to transition into eternal life. And if it's available to me, and it's not my intention to take my life, then it's perfectly acceptable and within the realm of good Catholic health care. Finally, it's important um, that we outline very directly um, in that third example I'll give you today, is that I direct my life not to be ended by assisted suicide or by euthanasia, which the Catholic Church defines as an action or omission, which of itself and by intention causes death, with the purpose of eliminating all suffering. So we're saying directly in the Catholic Healthcare Directive for Rhode Island that we in no way want to choose physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia. Truth be told, when this document was first created a number of years ago, it wasn't even on the radar that that could be a possibility in the state of Rhode Island. And yet, tragically, in 2015, it was introduced in the state of Rhode Island in the General Assembly. A possibility and a proposal for physician-assisted suicide in the state of Rhode Island. This is the most tragic possible thing you could ever offer to people who are overwhelmed already with the proposal of a terminal illness, with those who are already struggling at the end of their lives. Basically, the message that's being sent with physician-assisted suicide for those who are already thinking, am I a burden? Am I a difficult person to care for? The message we're sending to the elderly, sick, and for those who have a terminal illness is that this is an option that we think you should consider. That the exit door is wide open and you can step through it. What a terrible thing to say to somebody who's struggling with these difficult decisions at the end of life. And so we've outlined specifically that this is not the choice to make, that you're cared for, that you're loved, that you'll be made comfortable, that there are many people that are supporting you in your choices and decisions to be loved and to be helped as you transition from life to death to life eternal. One final caveat I'd like to mention here today, in addition to the health care directive that I've mentioned, so the advanced directives of a living will or a durable power of attorney for health care, uh, those are things we do in advance for the treatment that we want to receive. Uh, but in the state of Rhode Island, in January of 2014, um, there was legislation that was already begun for MOLST, or Medical Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment, that came into effect on January 1st 2014. So what is a MOLST? It's kind of a funny word. It's called POLST in other states. So MOLST is a medical order for life-sustaining treatment. In other states it's called a POLST or physician's order for life-sustaining treatment. And basically it's a medical document that is used for a patient in a terminal condition only. So somebody who's not been diagnosed by their attending physician as being in a terminal illness would not be able to even fill it out. So it's specifically geared to those 
who have been diagnosed with a terminal illness, which means they will no longer survive without life-sustaining treatment. And it indicates that patients' wishes for resuscitation and life-sustaining measures, such as CPR, mechanical ventilation, nutrition and hydration, the very things that we've been talking about throughout this whole program. And so the most document is what physicians refer to as medically actionable. In other words, the form is in fact a medical order itself immediately upon its completion. So think about an advanced directive. Somebody will say, in the case that I'm incapacitated and that I'm imminently dying, I don't want CPR. So DNR, do not resuscitate. Now that order might never be followed. The person could die of some other illness. They could die uh, before they come to that point. Uh, they could pass very peacefully without any possibility for those means. So in other words, the order is never drawn up. Only when the circumstance happens does the medical order get drawn up. Different with a MULST. So with a MULST, it is itself the order for that medical care. So somebody who's filled out a MULST and said, I do not want to be resuscitated, they have already made the DNR order. Somebody who has indicated on a MULST form, I don't want nutrition and hydration, immediately will never receive nutrition nor hydration. Um, just to keep in mind, that can be a challenge so, sometimes. So moving forward, what are some advantages to the MULST document? Well, one of the greatest advantages is that it's a portable document. In other words, it's immediately available to hospital and nursing staff as well as to emergency medical personnel, and it allows for the patient's wishes to be communicated directly when transferred from one facility to another. So if somebody needs to know right away, this person has already requested not to be resuscitated because of their terminal illness, so moving from the nursing home to the emergency room, um, we need to keep that in mind. Those are different important things. An advanced directive won't necessarily be applied right away. It won't necessarily be carried over from one institution to another. Now, while there are certainly many advantages and positive dimensions to most, many bishops, Catholic physicians, and Catholic medical organizations have expressed concerns about its potential risks regarding medical and ethical decision making. So there are potential risks here. There are things that we need to keep in mind and keep in the background. Recently, the Catholic bishops of Wisconsin wrote a letter to all the bishops in the United States addressing these very concerns. Uh, the Catholic Medical Association has likewise published a white paper documenting its own particular concerns. Now, there are other groups that have also supported most and said that, you know, if there's a right education, if there's a, a right implementation, if people take great care, and there are many people in Rhode Island that are doing that, we thank God for that, um, that it can be avoided with good training and good education. But nonetheless, um, I would outline very briefly three of the concerns that many of the bishops in healthcare personnel have brought up along the way. And the first one is this, just a brief summary. The first one is that most makes use of a checkbox mentality or checkbox style for treatment options that could suggest all choices as equal, when in fact, these kinds of choices are not morally neutral. And they have significant medical and ethical consequences. So you have a, a box that just checked off for nutrition hydration. I like that, I wanna check it off. You know? I don't like nutrition hydration, I check that box. Um, the mechanical ventilator sounds complicated, so I don't want it, or I would like one. So those things are not arbitrary. You know, we don't choose end-of-life health care based upon preference and based upon checkboxes. Um, so again, people that are trained well can explain these things well to people, but the temptation's there. The temptation is there to choose end-of-life care not based upon the duty to preserve life in due measure, not based upon the benefits and the burdens of the health care, not based upon the ordinary means that are obligatory, we're obliged to use them, uh, not based upon extraordinary care, which we're not obliged to use, but based upon preference or some scenario that we have dreamed up in our imagination um, that could be very, very burdensome to think about, differently from something in the actual circumstances that might necessitate something that's different 
from what we have thought about. It's important to remember that. Uh, one third caveat is that the verbiage they say or the wording of most uh, can sometimes favor non-treatment. In other words, it seems that the wording in certain POLST or MOLST documents um, seems to favor, you know, you don't really want this treatment, do you? <laughs> now again, thankfully the one in Rhode Island I don't think includes a lot of that wording or verbiage, but it's important to keep in mind uh, the sense of it. You know, somebody getting the sense when they fill out a MOLST form um, that this is something that I should be choosing against particular treatments and not considering to choose for them. So in conclusion, just some different caveats and some different things that I've asked you to think about for end-of-life health care. Um, we thank God for the gift and the grace that he has given to us uh, to prepare well. You know, now is the time when we're healthy. Now is the time when things are going well that we should complete an advanced directive. And that's why we've created a Catholic health care directive for the state of Rhode Island, and I hope that you'll make use of it. In conclusion, I'd like to share with you a couple of words from the Gospel of St. John that I began this first presentation with. And we'll conclude today with those words of Christ that are so consoling, so beautiful for us as we consider the fact that Christ is calling us not to death, but to eternal life in him. Jesus said to his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God, have faith also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If there were not, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for calling us to yourself. We thank you for the gift of Christ, your Son, who went to the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, who died and rose again to give us eternal life. We ask for your blessing upon us as we prepare in our own lives to follow you, to say yes to your call to life and to life eternal. And may we continue to move forward in faith, knowing that Christ has prepared a place for us in you, his Father's house. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.